Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much uh, for your grace. Thank you for bringing us here. We, Lord, uh, we gather in this place in your name, not because we have anything to show or anything to share with anybody else here. We are here to receive grace. May you fill me with the Holy Spirit. May you fill this church and this place and these people with the Holy Spirit, Lord, so that we will be able to understand deeply this mystery of this gospel, this good news. May we be able to hear it, understand it, practice it, and enjoy it to the days, um, to the end of days. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So um, today, that uh, video we saw uh, was a trailer. Um, the reason why I wanted to show you this is because a few, well, I guess it's like a year, over a year now, right? But when he passed away, a lot of people were concerned that Apple was going to, what? You guys remember? Apple was going to fail, right? They were really concerned that Apple was going to collapse because he was their original visionary, the, or the, you know, he was the guy that drove this company. But when he died, suddenly, everybody was like, ooh, what's going to happen? A year later, now, um, if you guys don't uh, remember, um, I'm going to remind you. See, there's a guy that took over. His name was Tim Cook, right? He was, uh, in my opinion, a disciple. Discipleship is such a big thing. It's such an important thing. In the church, it's very important. In the Korean church, it's very important. But also in like companies like this, tech companies, it's very important. The reason why I wanted to highlight this is because what are they doing right now? They, it, w with fully honoring and respecting him, they're taking the company into new directions that people are kind of like, a lot of you know, people are like, oh, this is the end. See, they're doing this. They're doing what Steve would have never done. But they're taking the company to a, a definitely a different place. But they're taking it, and I see like, wow, this is like an example of discipleship where they're not imitating him. You know, they're not trying to be Steve. You shouldn't try to be me. You shouldn't try to be Pastor Song. You shouldn't try to be Pastor You. You shouldn't try to be Jesus. We can't. First of all, we're not God. But you and I, were disciples. What does that mean? It, it doesn't mean that we're the exact same. We have likeness. We have, lear we have gleaned things from them. But for today, 2013, right now, what is God going to do in the next few months? That's what I want to challenge you guys. If you are a disciple, if you are a child of God, we look to the Word of God to find guidance, right? But a true disciple means we get our own answers. Sometimes that answer may be the same. Sometimes it's doing things in a different way. Any phone, any piece of technology, anything that you have that is part of your life is not something that was something that Jesus had. We, the things that we have, 2013, the things that you and I have in our pockets right now, like I've got two cell phones in my pocket. Can you imagine all the radiation and, and I don't know, maybe I'll get pelvic cancer. I don't know. But it does, the things that I have now, the life that I live now is so different. But we are called, today's message is called true disciple. We are called to be a disciple. What is a true disciple? I'm, I'm, I'm challenging that a true disciple is not somebody who's going to go put on a robe and put on like leather sandals like Jesus used to do, walk around in the wilderness, pretend there's no internet. We're not going to imitate exactly that just because Jesus walked that way. We are going to experience Jesus Christ living today. He's not, it's not like he's living only in the past, so we're living that way. He's alive today. How is he alive today? That's what a disciple is. Some, that's what a disciple experiences, and that's what a disciple lives, living Jesus today. Our passage today is in Philemon. It's our last week in Philemon. I'm going to summarize Philemon, but Philemon right now has, you know, one chapter. If you open up your Bible to the book of Philemon, there's one chapter. We're going to read verse 23 and 25 together. And I want to really go into this topic, this subject of what is a true disciple. Verse 23, it says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. See, um, this is Paul's writing. Uh, he's writing to Philemon. And he's telling Philemon about Epaphras. He's telling them about Mark. And, and, and some of these guys are also prisoners. They were in, in jail with him. And he's greeting. He's, he's writing this letter to Philemon. His, 
this passage, if we when, when we look into it, we're going to see like what the blessing or what the importance of a disciple is. You know, um, in one of the messages that I've heard, someone said this, having a true disciple next to me in my life is the greatest blessing I've had. A pastor said this. He said that because he had, you know, we're blessed people. If you are here at church and if you have met Jesus, then you are a blessed person. But what is the greatest blessing? Some of us, it might be because maybe through church you met, you know, the love of your life. Some of maybe you came to church and you found that job. Some of maybe you came to church and you learned uh, a new culture or language. It could be whatever. Many blessings are in our life. But what is the greatest blessing? I'm going to give you the argument that the greatest blessing in Christ is having a true disciple, being a true disciple, is true discipleship. Number one, if true disciples arise in your life, then this is considered, if it is, uh, it is a, the greatest blessing. If we look in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus leaves his disciples here on the earth, he tells them to go and make disciples. That's his last command. When you're about to leave, usually the last thing you say is very important. Jesus' last command was to tell his disciples to go and make disciples, other disciples. Secondly, look at the people he left behind. Jesus left behind disciples. He called these 12 as his disciples, and those were the people that he left behind. Those 12 people ended up changing the world. We gather because of the name of Jesus. But it all happened because of those 12. It only took 12. Jesus is, to me, Jesus is saying, look, the most important thing, the greatest blessing, the, the key for everything for, uh, for us to receive blessings is discipleship. Thirdly, Paul, he had many disciples next to him. And these people that he mentions right here, Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, they're all his disciples. It's like he's leaving, he's, he's writing, his, this is the end of the chapter, right? These are the last verses of Philemon. Like when Jesus left, what did he say? Go and make disciples. When Paul is cleaning up his letter, he's saying goodbye. Sincerely, Paul, right? As he's writing it, he's greeting Philemon and mentioning his disciples. Why is he mentioning the disciples? He's mentioning it because, let me tell you a little bit about these people. Who is Epaphras? If you guys remember, when we went through Colossians a few months ago, we, his name popped up. In Colossians 4.12, it uh, records Epaphras as uh, he was uh, the founder of the church in Colossae. In other words, Philemon was also from that region. In that Ephesus, uh, if he, if he, he was one of the uh, members in that region, in Ephesus and Colossae. And the church of Colossae that Paul wrote the letter of Colossians to, Colossians, Colossians too, was founded by Epaphras. That's the guy that founded it. He was one of the key workers in this region that Philemon lives in. He was basically one of the senior ministers in Paul's group. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. Paul is, say, Epaphras is my, he's like my fellow right here. He also introduces, who does he introduce next? He introduces his fellow workers, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. Do you guys, you guys remember Mark? Remember Mark? That was like one of my favorite chapters. Actually, that was the first chapter when we started EM. When we first started this English ministry, we were talking about Mark. And who was Mark? He was translator for Peter. Most people, well, that was something we, just, we, didn't, we didn't really know, right? Because that's not everyone's like, okay, what is he really known for? What is Mark really known for? He's known for being a deserter. He's the one who couldn't hang. He was like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm going to go home. Like this mission trip, I'm just not. And he went home. He's the one who left Paul. You guys remember? Right? Mark is not the perfect disciple. But he's in this list. I, li I like that. He's a true disciple. See, what happened with Mark was Mark disappointed Paul. Seriously disappointed Paul. Later, this would be the reason why Paul and Barnabas would split. You guys know that uh, in the Bible, Paul and Barnabas split, right? Okay? That's usually where most people stop the story, like, oh yeah, Paul and Barnabas, they split because Mark Mark was a wimp, Mark was weak, he gave up, and ha, so you guys, don't give up. 
fight. And you guys, be like Paul, right? And it's like, yeah, I'm gonna all be, I'm gonna be Paul, and I'm gonna be, I'm not gonna be like Mark. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be like, you know. But that's not where the story ends. You know what happens? This is after this all happened. Paul's writing this after all this has happened. What happens is Paul and Mark, they meet again. Barnabas and Paul, they come back together again. The, what, what is the thing that Satan tries to do? He tries to divide us. But you know what the work of the Holy Spirit does? It always brings us together. Brings Paul and Barnabas back together. Brings Mark back with Paul. And Mark, I mean, Paul calls Mark, you know, one of his sons. He is emphasizing this role uh, of Mark in, in this letter because remember the context. Who is Paul writing to? Philemon. And who is he writing about? Onesimus. That useless Ironically named. His name means useful. But useless disciple. Right? This useless slave. In certain translations, we read, uh, I read the old King James Version. And it actually, this, in that translation, it doesn't say slave. It says servant. Um, but remember, we talked about like what slave in this context means. He's mentioning Mark because he's trying to remind Philemon when he says, hey, remember your slave Onesimus? He's now good with me. I got his back. He owes you nothing, pretty much. If he owes you anything, put it on my card. Put it in my, my account, right? And don't, re and don't forget what you owe me, right? Onesimus, take care of him. The reason why he can say that is because of Mark. Mark was somebody who wronged Paul in many ways. Paul was such a guy of principle that he was like, you know, we're going to save the world for Jesus. We're going to go to this field. And you guys are coming with me, my disciples. Let's go. And he's like running. And then he turns, looks back. And he's like, where, where, where's Mark? Mark, oh, his, his feet hurt. He had to go home. You know, he was tired. He had to, and you know what, Paul? You know, Paul's not the kind of guy of like, oh, really? Okay, let's wait. Let me go find him. Paul's like, are you kidding me? And like, he's like, forget him. Forget you. Let's go. I got to do this. Christ called, Christ blinded me, called me, and I got to do this. Forget Mark. Bah humbug, you know? Like, and then what happens? That, that's Paul on his like, mission trip. Years later, he's calling Mark as one of his trusted disciples. I think that's the thing that, to me, it's more important that Paul brought him back into the circle brought him back than what had happened. Why? Because sometimes I feel like Mark. Sometimes I'm not perfect. Sometimes I just get tired. You know, well, let, let's do this. Let's do this meeting. Let's do that. Let's do have this festival. Let's do this. Let's do this Bible study. And then if eventually get tired, I'm like, oh, okay. I don't really want to go sometimes. I'm like, oh, but before Mark, before I heard the story of Mark, I was like, oh, but that's not what Jesus would do. That's not edifying. And then now it's like, oh, wait, it's okay. Think of Mark. You know, like, oh, yeah, I'm better than Mark at least. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But the Bible is full of disciples that we should look at carefully because they are not exactly the stereotype that we might have in your mind. Peter, I mean, come on. Do we have to even talk about Peter? That guy, cock a doo doo, -doo three times. And he's like, no, I don't know Jesus. Gee, who? You know, like, he just did not want to be associated with him. And he's the guy putting out the sword in front of Jesus. He's like, when Jesus is around, he's like, I'm going to kill this guy for you, Jesus. I'm going to cut off his ear. Yeah. And then Jesus is like, yo, chill. You're going to deny me three times. He's like, huh? The Bible is full of people like you and me. Some people are so perfect. Dang it, I hate them. You know, like, ah, okay, but got to love them too, right? True disciples like Mark, like Luke. Luke was his physician. He was his doctor, right? He's the one who wrote the book of Acts. He was the one who wrote the book of Luke. He was like probably the most scientific, rational thinker of that circle group of friends. Are you guys, are any of you guys have friends that are sometimes a little too analytical, a little too scientific, you know, a little too smart? Pray. 
I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be like Luke. There are so many different types of personalities. You and I can identify with so many different people in the Bible. But they are here in the Bible because God, through Paul, is reminding us who is a true disciple. Paul was comfortable enough with Philemon to make these kinds of personal requests. Right? He says even like um, in verse 22 about, oh, make a guest room because I'm going to be, you know, he's like, yo, get my room ready, you know, clean sheets, please. You know, like I'll, I'll be back. I mean, this is how personal uh, the relationship with Philemon was. You know, even though, uh, I, I talked about this a little bit, but, you know, the second time that Paul was in jail, right? The first time he was, he was like in house arrest. So he was kind of comfortable, right? And he, the second time he was in, and he had visitors. The second time he was in jail, though, I remember, I remember I told you, he was not comfortable. He was like longing to meet people, to see people, you know? He was like in a dungeon type of jail. And he was telling people, dude, I don't think I'm going to get out. I don't know if I'm going to get out. Like, I'm worried. I'm, Paul was scared. I don't know if Paul was writing to Philemon here, really thinking that he was going to come out, or just simply hoping that he was going to come out. But look at his words. Well, actually, it's, it's this verse before. But he, he had a desire to come, and he had a desire to be with Philemon, to be with his disciples, to be with his friends. The blessing of the evangelist and the disciple in that relationship between Paul and Philemon, or in your relationship between you and Jesus, or in your relationship between you and your head pastor, or in your relationship between you and your Sunday school teacher, or your youth group leader, community leader, in any of those things, we have to remember that the relationship is eternal. The blessing is eternal. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by grace, and it is of the Spirit. In other words, be careful when we look around the people we're here with right now. When we die, I hope you don't have bad relationships with anybody here. If I don't have a good relationship with Tony, and when we die, I'm going to be stuck with him forever. Our relationship is a spiritual relationship. This, this, this relationship, this blessing of the evangelist and the disciple relationship is something that is of the spirit. It is eternal. Now, that doesn't mean, okay, hey, hey, Tony, can you loan me 10 bucks? Hey, Sam, can you loan me 20 bucks? Hey, everybody here, can you loan me money? I'll pay you back in heaven. You know, like, it's not, that's not what the point of it is. Is But I, I'm trying to remind you, this is a spiritual thing. This is beyond just my relationship with somebody else. Have you had a relationship that's been broken? Have you been in a relationship where you've, you've been hurt? You, sometimes we need time. We need time before we can mend those relationships. Sometimes we won't mend those relationships and we may die. Don't have any regret though. When you see them in heaven, even if it was that, you know, maybe it was your first Sunday school teacher that shared the gospel with you, but later on, you, you know, they made, you just didn't get along with them. No regrets. Better to make amends with them in this life, but in heaven, remember, we are all going to be together in the body of Christ. Philemon is a true disciple, okay? Paul is emphasizing his disciples to Philemon, reminding him, look, these are my other disciples. I don't know the exact relationships between all of them because there's not that much information uh, about uh, all the disciples. But let's look at Onesimus. Onesimus and Philemon did not have a very good example, uh, did not have a very good relationship. But Paul is saying, he's, a, he's my disciple. Work it out. To these true disciples, what the book of Philemon is, is about forgiveness. It is about forgiveness. It's about the character. What kind of person can forgive? It's about the actions. How do you forgive? And then it's about the motives of the one who forgives. What is the reason for your forgiving this person? Sometimes it's because you realize, well, I understand. Oh, yeah, that guy... He struggled with this. I've, I've, I've been through similar things. You know, I understand. I, I can forgive him. That's the good way. The other way, Paul is saying, look, I don't care. You owe me. I'm telling you, forgive him. And 
all right, you know. Whatever method you have, whatever motive you have to forgive, Philemon is saying, it's forgiveness. That is a fruit of love. If you cannot forgive, how can you really love somebody? A Christian view of love, um, well, another pastor, he described from this, uh, from the book of Philemon, that, is it, that Philemon is an example of Christian love. You know, like we have love between family, we have love between relationships, we have love with like, uh, with God, agape love, you know. But a Christian love, what is the characteristics of a Christian love? It is, number one, being grateful for the best in others. Number two, seeking the welfare of others. Number three, dealing honestly with others. Number four, bearing the burden of others. Number five, believes the best of others. You know what's the common thing about all five of those things about Christian love it's all about others it's like man that sucks you know love should be about me but Christian love is about others now what if they don't love you back now, what if they steal from you? What if they run away? You own them, but they run away. What if they poop on your desk? Onesimus is the example. What if they get tired? They're just weak sauce. Oh, I don't want to go evangelize today. I'm just going to go TV or read a book. I'm going to check my feed. Got to go to Twitter. Even if, unfortunately, we got to love them. That's what Christian love is. When Mark abandoned Paul, if you got to go somewhere and your ride is like, oh, I can't go, see ya, good luck, or dude, I'm so sorry. You can't be mad at them anymore. That's not Christian love. Christian love is all about the other person. These are the traits of the true disciple. Today, um, in our secular world, um, there was a lot of things that are going on recent news. You know, um, for example, if, I don't know if you guys heard, but the Supreme Supreme Court made like a landmark case decision, and it was very controversial. People are like, some people angry, some people crying, and it was like five four. You know, it was not a like everybody voted like equally. It's a very complicated situation, something that requires a lot of prayer. But you know what? Um, one article that I read talked about how everyone voted along the way that they thought they were going to vote. You know, like there's people who are considered conservative, there's people who are considered like um, liberal, and and they everyone nobody there was no surprise. Every, they, everyone voted and and did it decided the way that they thought. And you know what it reminded me of? I was thinking, oh yeah, that's why people were making such a big deal a few months ago, a few years ago, because President Obama got elected. Because if President Obama got elected or President Bush, or President, whatever party you're in, then they're going to pick a person to be a judge in that, like, their, you know, um, that leans towards their thinking, right? So, in the political system, this is a big deal, because it might come years later, like, like this case. But, I was like, dang, that's even a form of discipleship. Uh, maybe it's because I'm, 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 I'm like, Maybe I'm grabbing for straws, but I was just because I was thinking about okay, what is a disciple? Because I was thinking about this too, and I was like, man, even the even the judges, they're disciples. They they voted along their party lines, you know. They 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 did it according to what they thought was going to happen, and I was like, man, sometimes that you know, like it kind of confused me. But God was telling, God was trying to reveal to me more than the decision. Apart from that, the example that God is telling me to think about and you to think about is the importance of disciples. The importance of true disciples. People that are flawed, that we connect with, that we're going to be with forever. People you might not like. Five to four, you know, in like some other writings they wrote, these four really didn't like what the five decided. And then these five were like, these four are like, and they're the same court. You don't have to like each other. 
You don't have to like me, but you're stuck with me, at least for now. You know, I don't have to like you, but I'm stuck with you. And that, in that, is the love of God. Like, what? This sucks. But it doesn't. The mystery is right there. How can you love someone that doesn't love you? How can you love someone that hurts you? How can you do that? You and I, the reason why we are called to be true disciples is because you and I, are, our, our position or our role is a transporter. Not a transformer, transporter. What do we transport? What do we influence others with? For you and I, it should be the gospel. You and I are a messenger of the gospel, of the true good news of Jesus Christ that is revealed in God's word. What is our role in that? I want to read to you guys a little article that I found. It said, it was an article about how cutlery, you know cutlery? Spoons, forks. Okay, and they, they, I think they just did spoons and forks. There were no chopsticks, you know, racists. They said, okay, this article said they found that oddly, eating with a heavy spoon made yogurt seem cheaper, less dense, and generally less likable, but also sweeter. When eating with a blue spoon, participants found the same yogurt saltier. They take the same yogurt, okay, with different spoons. They found that the same yogurt with a blue spoon was saltier. When eaten with a white spoon, it seemed sweeter. As for, uh, they did a cheese experiment. Participants found that cheese eaten from a knife tasted saltier, while there was little difference for, between eating it with a spoon or fork. Okay, it's like random, right? Why am I talking about this random article? This is their explanation. How we experience food is a multi-sensory experience evol involving taste, feel of the food in the mouth, aroma, feasting of our eyes. Even before we put food into our mouths, our brains have made a judgment about it, which affects our overall experience. Subtly changing eating uh, implements and tableware, cutlery, can affect how pleasurable or filling food appears. Your tools to eat that food determine how you conceive of that, perceive of that food. Our spiritual food is the gospel. You and I are created beings that have been separated from God, right? We were separated, and that separation is the origin of all of our problems. Because of our sin, there is nothing that we can do to solve this problem. And for millennia, we know that people have tried. People still try. Only when they realize that they fail, and we share the good news that, hey, someone came to, to solve this problem that you and I have. Knowing this, God sent his son, Jesus of Nazareth, to be the sacrifice for our sins, to atone for our transgressions, fulfill the role of Savior, Redeemer of man, right? That is the gospel. That's the basic, like, if we, if, if we tell hey, what's the gospel? We summarize in like four sentences. That, I just read it to you. Our spiritual food is the gospel. But the utensil God uses to connect with us, the utensils, that are used to deliver this spiritual food to other people. That's something I want us to think about. See, Jesus, in a way, because he's a prophet, meaning he's a connector to God, he is the utensil God uses to connect with us, you and me. He is also the one who died on the cross as a living sacrifice for our sins, you know, that role of the priest. He did also the role of overcoming death and Satan by rising again as the king, right? Prophet, priest, king. We know this. We've heard this. If you come to church, you've heard this before. That is the food. That is the spiritual good news that you and I all have. But, does your gospel taste saltier than my gospel? Does this person's gospel taste sweeter? Does this person's gospel, even though they know the same thing, it just makes you want to spit it out, like,
Does my gospel, me standing here talking to you, does it just taste bland, boring? It's okay. You, know, I'm, you guys, I know you guys are thinking, yeah, this is, it's been so long. When's it going to stop? I wish the mic would turn off. Why is the air conditioner being quiet today? I like that. You know, like, whatever you view of my gospel that I'm sharing with you, it's based on the utensils that, I'm, that I possess. The gospel that you and I have the, of Jesus Christ, that food is the same. But are you a blue spoon? Are you a white spoon? Are you a knife? Are you a fork? Are you a toothpick? I just want us to remember the difference between the food and the utensil. You are not the food. I am not here with any power of mine own. The only thing that I can share is what God has revealed to me. And I'm trying to do it in the way with the tools that God has given me. You, in your workplace, if you're a secretary, if you work in an office, if you're a business person, if you are an athlete, if you are a, someone in entertainment, if you're someone in education, if you're someone in politics, the tools that God has given you, the utensils he has given you, will make a difference in how people taste this spiritual food. Now, I'm not going to argue about if it's better to be saltier or sweeter. Let's just don't be nasty, okay? Let's just not present our food, spiritual food, dirty. You know, utensils need to get washed. If you don't, don't drop it on the floor and then just, here, my hand, you know, like, here's glob of cheese. The good news, the food, the spiritual, oh, there goes the air conditioning. Da, 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 da. The spiritual food is the good news. Are you glad that God has done this? God has called you as an instrument. God has called you as cutlery. God has called you to be used at the table of the king. We are called to be used as tools at God's table, at God's party. This is the good news. Yesterday at Mission Home, we talked about this a little bit, but when, it, when you ask people, how are you doing? You know, they say, a lot of people say, oh, I'm good, I'm good. Good is a state, is a condition. And we call this gospel the good news. But in other translations, there's, a trans, there's translations where they call the gospel glad tidings. Glad tidings. And this one pastor's message was talking about the glad news. Not the good news, the glad news. And so she said, you know, if people ask you, how are you doing? And you say, I'm good. It ends the conversation because it's done. But if you say, how are you doing? And you're like, I'm glad. If you end the conversation, you're weird. You know, like, how, if, if I, like, hey, how are you doing? And like, I ask, you know, Claire, how are you doing? She's like, I'm good. And I'm like, See you later. See you next week. Bye. But if I say, hey, Claire, how are you doing? She's like, I'm glad. I'm like, and if I go like, see you next week. I'm weird, right? If she says, I'm glad, what naturally will come? Really? What, what, what happened? What's new? I met Jesus or I came to church and I received grace. I didn't break my neck falling. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever is it about God and life that are you really glad about? The difference between good and glad. He's uh, some sort of lexiconical, lingual, single, something. I, I forgot. My sister told me yesterday, the, the official, whatever. But the difference in translation that we have to pick up is we are given the good news. The gospel is good news. In our life, this good news, okay, this is good food. If I give you this good food, with from my hand, I put it in your mouth, like, here, eat, and put it in your mouth. You're not, you're gonna be like, oh, what the? It doesn't matter if this tastes like heaven. You didn't like that it was stuffed into your mouth, right? But if you are a, a tool, like a fork, a clean fork, hopefully, and you take this piece of cake and you eat it, you can, you, you can really be glad. Like, why are you glad? Because I, I tasted this delicious cake. This good food, this good cake can become glad 
or can become sad or mad. What else? <laughs> sad, glad, mad, rad, tad. Whatever. The utensil is important because that's how people can take it. You and I are the utensils for God. The food is good. The gospel is good. Do we need to pretend otherwise? I don't think so. I think if you really understand this gospel, and it's really good to you, and it really is glad to you, makes you glad, that's contagious. That is what everybody, when they hear, will be moved because they can see and feel and understand that Jesus Christ is living in your life, that you really have a reason that you are glad. Conviction, faith, perseverance, that's not the food. Those are our tools. I want us to remember that the, in, the utensils influence the taste of our food. You and I influence the taste of our food. Do you know why so many people in America, a very Christian-friendly nation, hate Christians? Do you know why so many Christians are labeled lunatics and irrational, silly? I think the church has left a bad taste. Taking something that is good and being a dirty utensil. You know, taking that cake and stuffing it in their mouth like it's good for you. You ever had like broccoli when you were a kid? Man, I hated broccoli. It's good for you. Eat it. And you eat one piece. Your mom dumps ten more. You did. But now, now I know broccoli is good for me, so I eat it. I'm like playing catch up, you know. I haven't eaten. I, I wasn't eating broccoli for 20 years of my life. Now I got. I got to catch up. I got to eat all the broccoli I can eat. The food is good. The food is good. I just hope you and I. We're glad we're eating this food. We're glad we can share this food to others. And other people, when they hear this gospel, they'll be glad. We can make a difference in the lives of everybody we meet. This relationship, this characteristic, this description that I'm sharing with you is the description of a true disciple. That's the difference between a true disciple and a fake disciple. If you want to accept this food, if you have this food in your heart, let it nourish your body and join me right now. Let's pray. Some of you guys, you know, have been in our church. Some of you guys are new to church. Some of you guys are not even at church. And you know what? Now that some of this is going on the internet, I really was, convert, uh, was convinced. You know what we need to do? We need to confirm this. Do you have this food in your heart? If you do, then you probably won't have a problem joining me. But if you don't, if you never thought that, you know, this gospel, this good news, good news, never was something that made me glad. Right now, we can do something about that. We can pray. I want us to pray together. Let's all close our eyes. I want to lead us in this prayer. But I want this to be the prayer where we accept the food that will nourish our body spiritually and physically. Loving God, dear God, dear loving God, thank you for your wonderful love and plan of salvation. I realize that I am a sinner and I repent. I open up my heart, accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. I thank you for giving me forgiveness of my sins, for saving me. I want to obey your will. I want to live a life that glorifies you. Use me as a great utensil for this good food. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that, You've prayed this prayer before. You pray that prayer now. You pray that prayer anytime in the future. If that confession is truly true, then you and I, all of us, we are eternally connected. Whether I you know, know your name, whether I don't know your name, we are now eternally connected in God's kingdom. We are on the road. We are on the way to be true disciples. Amen.